morning we're going to be back in Psalms. As you know, we were in um, Isaiah, and we are continuing in Isaiah, uh, but we're rotating from Isaiah to Psalms as we're in the portion of Isaiah that is uh, um, the surrounding nations and their judgment. So it's a lot of doom and gloom. Um, so we want to break up the doom and gloom uh, every other week and go through a couple of Psalms and uh, let the Lord minister to us in that way. But we don't want to skip anything. That's really what the importance is of what we believe that the Word of God is there in its entirety for a reason. And we need to understand and go through the Word of God verse by verse, line by line, precept by precept, because God put it in there for a reason. And we can't just skip over and do the things we want to do because they make us feel good. Sometimes you're going to have to understand that some of the other things there are there for a reason to help us to grow in our relationship and walk with the Lord. So next week we'll be back in Isaiah chapter 16. So for those of you who want to read ahead, um, you are more than welcome to do that. The reason you'll probably want to read ahead is you know that we're kind of changing our teaching style here. Uh, that we're not really trying to make it just a sermon where I stand in front of you and preach all day. I mean, I will still teach, but I will ask questions and give opportunity for you to respond, give opportunity for discussion of the things that we're learning, and I think that's important. So with that said, let's turn in our Bibles to Psalms chapter 2. Psalms chapter 2. We left off really in verse 6, but I think uh, what I would like to do is just go through the whole psalm. Uh, that way we have the continuity, and then next week we'll pick it up in Isaiah chapter 16. So let's starting in verse 1, Psalms chapter 2. Why do the nations raise, rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possessions. You shall break them off with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Therefore, now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Father, we ask you to speak to our hearts. Give us understanding. Let your spirit minister to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it looks like we got a little doom and gloom in the Psalms too, doesn't it? Huh? You know, this psalm uh, is really a psalm, a messianic psalm, and who here knows what a messianic psalm really means? What is that? Psalms about Christ. Psalms about Christ, about Jesus Christ. It's a foretelling, so to speak, about Jesus. And we want to read verses 1 through 3 again as we go through this messianic psalm that really is going to point to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, he said, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So it says the nations are raging and the peoples, or the people, are plotting why are they raging, and what are they raging and plotting against? Anybody know? What they're raging against or plotting against? Well, if you don't know, then I'm going to tell you. <laughs> it's really a rhetorical question that David is posing here. 
It's a rhetorical question, which really means it's a question that doesn't need an answer. David is asking this question and showing really his unbelief that the nations and the people are actually doing something. And what are they doing? They're raging and they're plotting against God is what they're doing. Now, do you think that today there is raging and plotting going on against God? And if so, <clears throat> give me some examples. How is there raging and plotting going on against God today? Well, we should be getting all kinds Taking of... Taking God out of our schools. God's out of our schools. Taking the Ten Commandments down from various government buildings. And what are they putting up in this place? <laughs> Statue, but the statue of Satan is being replaced in all states. Can you believe that? A half foot bronze statue of Satan. Goat head, horns, hooves, with two adoring children looking up to him. Yeah. That tongue statue is put beside any Christian Ten Commandments or anything else, cross, crucifix, until they're removed. Now, if that's not raging against God, I don't know what, what is, Mary. So, in my work, on one of the people that has their office right there, they can have a little statue of Buddha, Buddha mm -hmm. right there. We can't even talk about God. Right. Nor we can can't, you even we have can't a pray. We can't pray. That would be, you know, bad because mm -hmm. I would be going down one line. But I can have a statue of Buddha there. That's right. Now, Andy. Also, at the ark where we go as a program, they won't even let us talk about God there either. Right. Or, or not they allowed to. Let us talk about the politics either. Right. Right. So, taking so, God out of the pledge. Taking God out of the pledge of allegiance. Taking him out of the pledge of allegiance. Trying to change history. Alec. ISIS. To change history. ISIS. ISIS. They're talking about removing, I now pronounce you man and wife from their spouse. Okay. You're kidding. No. So you can be man and God, they, or I mean man and goat, or man and <laughs> They God. are raging against God. And it's happening <coughs> to a greater degree every single day. Yes. Why is this happening? Why is this taking place? David also said that the rulers that they counsel together. So if they're plotting against God, then what are they counseling about? Well, I think we answered many of them just now. They're counseling about how can they remove more of God within our society? How can we get these Christians out of our lives? They're bugging us. They're too goody two-shoes. We don't want them here anymore. And that's really what's happening in our culture. The Christians are being persecuted. It's starting to happen in our country. We're starting to see it. In other countries, it's already escalated. And we know that ISIS is just murdering Christians left and, left and right if they do not renounce Jesus Christ. They are beheading them. So we live in a very wicked world, in a very wicked land. How do we deal with this? How do we deal? How do we allow our children to deal with this? Is this anything new that's happening? Folks, since the time of Babel, people have continued to band together and plot against God. This is, you know, Samuel said there's nothing new under the sun, right? There's nothing new under the sun. When people band together, they can come up with more wicked deeds, can't they? They can think about more things that they can do. In fact, I want you to think of a time when you plan something, maybe a party or you were planning an event. Did you want to do it by yourself? Or did you want to have someone, did you want to call some people up and say, hey, I want to plan this event, come on, let's over, let's brainstorm, right? You have businesses that have brainstorm meetings. They get together to try to figure out how they can do things. Why do you think they do that? Because when you're together, you can come up with more ideas. And so for us, you know, as Christians, we can come up with greater ideas of how we can reach the community, 
how we can share the love of Jesus Christ to let people know the truth. But on the side of the world, the counsel that they're making is, how can we do the opposite? How can we stop these people? Verse 2 makes it clear that they're planning and that they're plotting against the Lord and His anointed. So let's talk about the word Lord for a minute. Whenever you see the word Lord, capital L, lowercase o-r-d, and then you have Lord, all capitals, l-o-r-d, there are two distinct meanings for those. Anybody know what they are? What the two meanings are? When you see, in your Bibles, when you see capital L, lowercase o-r-d, or all capital l-o-r-d, have you guys noticed that, that you see it in there? Anybody know what the, what the difference is? I just always felt capital is all means God. Mm -hmm. It does. So small, smaller case letters refer to Jesus Christ. Well, the way, you're close. Capital L-O-R-D is referring to the triune God, or I should say lowercase, capital L-L-O-R-D is referring to Jesus, the, the triune Godhead, God, Father, Holy Spirit. And Lord is when it's all capitalized in the Old Testament, is really where you see it. It is translating the Hebrew word Yahweh for the name of God. And the anointed here in this passage means Messiah in the Hebrew. So anointed means Messiah in the Hebrew. And when that word is brought over into the Greek New Testament, it means Christos, or in English, Christ. The anointed is Christ, it's Jesus. So what we see here is a great worldwide movement that is against God and Jesus and His anointed. Now, is this happening today? Is there a worldwide movement against Jesus? Well, I think that's kind of a rhetorical question too, isn't it? Because we know that there is. We know that it's really... Well, I think my battery died here. It did. That's, uh, that's all right. We know that there is a worldwide movement against Jesus. Let's talk about some examples of maybe some of the specific worldwide movements that are against Jesus. And does it have to be simply in the unbelievers or the non-believers, or does it even take place amongst quote-unquote Christians? What do you think? It happens in both, doesn't it? We have, even in the Christian community, we have people going against Jesus Christ and going against His teachings and saying we need to be more conforming. We need to be more kind. We need to be more acceptable. And what do they want you to be more acceptable of? Sin. Compromise. It's okay. It's not a big deal. God's, God will still love them. Well, of course He will. He'll never stop loving them. But that doesn't mean that He won't judge them. People must repent of their sins, and it's not for us to be the ones that are encouraging anything to bring anyone to a path that takes them away from what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ and who He is and why He came. The world seems to look at the Lord as a bondage bringer. Have you ever thought about that? They look at Jesus as bondage. They look at God as, oh, I don't want to be a Christian. You guys, you can't do nothing. How many of you heard that from friends or people? Or you, what, are some peop what do some people say to you? It's boring. What's, it's boring. Yeah, what's the fun of being a Christian? What's the, yeah, what's the fun? You just, what do you guys do? This is stupid. Right? I mean, we hear this constantly. Well, of course to them it's dumb and stupid. You know why? Because that's what the Bible says. It says, for those who do not know the Lord, it seems like foolishness. It seems like folly. Like they don't really understand what it's all about. The Lord is not a bondage bringer, folks. He is a bondage breaker. And that's what we need to remember. He doesn't bring bondage. He breaks it. He breaks the chains of, chains of bondage in the life of the Christian. So for the Christian, 
Can you guys tell me some of the bondage the Lord breaks in the life of a Christian? What has he broken in your life? What are some of the bondages that he's broken in your life? Fear. Fear. Ignorance and stupidity. Ignorance and stupidity. What else? What has he broken in your life? Sin. Hmm? Sin. Sin? Anxiety? Mm -hmm. Still working on this. There are so many things that God breaks bondage in our lives. I like what Spurgeon says about the Lord being a bondage breaker rather than the bondage bringer. Here's a quote from him. To a graceless neck, the yoke of Christ is intolerable, but to the saved sinner, it is easy and light. We may judge ourselves by this. Do we love that yoke, or do we wish to cast it from us? I really like that. You see, the people that have this yoke upon them, it's hard. It's a burden. They don't like it. But for the Christian, the yoke is light. And we want it there. We want that yoke upon us. We want to be led in the direction that Christ wants us to go. Because he knows what's better for our lives than we do, doesn't he? It's important for us. You know, we live in a world that is full of hatred, not only to us, but for God, for Jesus, for anything that we stand for. But we also live in a world where, those po where there are many who post to be true Christians. Remember, we talked about them last week, and we called them the Moabites of the world. That even though Moabites are gone, there are still Moabites here in this world representative of what the Moabites stood for. And they're even more dangerous than the non-Christian. Those who pose or pretend to be Christians, they can pull and lead people astray. And they do that. They lead people down a wrong path. I found a great story that I'd like to share from Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and it speaks of this very thing. And it's more true today, I believe, than it was even in the days when Dr. McGee shared it. I'm also going to have it up on the screen so you can read along. Because it's a little bit longer than the normal short stories I read. Quote, For many years when I was pastor in downtown Los Angeles, the leading liberal in this country pastored a church nearby. Actually, I had great respect for him because he was one liberal who was honest. For instance, he would just come out and say he did not believe in the virgin birth. And if you don't believe it, I'd like for you to say it and not beat around the bush. He had a question and answer program on the radio. I had a question and answer program on the radio. And listeners would feed questions to both of us to set us in opposition. Every year we went through that same little ritual during the Christmas season. I always enjoyed it. So one time we both were invited to a banquet, and I think it was done purposely. We were seated together. I got there first and sat down. I saw his name there. In a minute, he came in. I felt somebody put his arm around me and say, you know, Brother McGee, you and I ought to be much closer together. We preach the same Jesus, and he sat down. I said to him, are you sure we preach the same Jesus? Oh, well, don't we? I don't think so. Let me ask you some questions. Was the Jesus you preach virgin born? Of course not. Well, the one I preach is virgin born. The Jesus you preach, did he perform miracles? I do not believe in miracles. Well, the Jesus I preach performed miracles. The Jesus you preach, did he die on a cross for the sins of the world? Of course he died on a cross, but not for the sins of the world. Then... The Jesus I preach died a substitutionary, vicarious death for the sins of man. Do you believe that Jesus rose bodily? Oh no, of course not. 
Obviously, then, you and I are not preaching about the same Jesus. Folks, in our culture today, there are people and churches like this, and they are growing in number. And they will take scripture, and they will twist it and tweak it just enough so it does not share the truth of the gospel. We all know there's, we can name all the cults out there, there's many. But we must be bold, as Dr. McGee was. When we see this happen, we can't just say, yeah, brother, you know, we preach the same Jesus. You know, and I had that encounter with a pastor here in town. And, you know, he did the same thing to me. Well, you know, we're, we're close. We, we preach the same thing. I said, no, we don't. I said, you don't believe in the triune Godhead. I said, that's an essential. I said, you believe that you have to be baptized to be saved. That's not written in the Bible. So we don't preach the same Jesus. You preach that there's only one, that there is no triune Godhead. Well, we're preaching a different Jesus, aren't we? And so we need to be bold when people come to us and tell, say these things to us. And we need to be able to share the truth and defend our faith. In verses 4 through 6, we see something interesting about our God. He who sits in the heavens. Bethany, would you go out there and quiet him down and have him, have him go somewhere else, please? In verses 4 through 6, we see something very interesting about God. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set the king on Zion, my holy hill. Here we see that God who sits in heaven, it says he laughs. Now, how do you feel about God laughing? I mean, let's be honest. Can you picture God laughing in heaven, or do you picture him serious in heaven, sitting behind his Romley desk and looking at all his paperwork and getting ready for the judgment day and getting ready to take care of all these things. Do you picture God in heaven, heaven ever laughing? No, I think he's got an extreme sense of humor. Okay. <laughs> he created you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> you agree for yourself or for your wife? <laughs> You know, a lot of times we picture God without a sense of humor, and, and the ones who can picture him with a sense of humor are usually the Christians. That we know that God has a sense of humor, that he is a God of, of I mean, if he gave us laughter, why wouldn't he have laughter? Are we not created in his image? Yep. And what does laughter do to you? It makes you feel better. You know, there's actually been studies done that says laughter is healthy for the for the, for the body? It adds years to your life. Yeah. I mean, it adds years to your life. Laughter is extremely good for you. Now, God most definitely does laugh, but like I said, a lot of people can't picture it. I want to read you another little story that illustrates this, a cute little story. There used to be, and it's a true story, there used to be a dear maiden lady in a church I served who never found any humor in the Bible. When I gave a message which cited some humorous incident, she used to come down, shake a bony finger under my nose, and say, Pastor, you are being irreverent to find humor in the Bible. I said to her, don't you wish you could? <laughs> she's gone now to be with the Lord, and I certainly hope she's had a good laugh since she has been there because she has gone to the place where she can have a good time. She needs to have a good time. She never had one down here. You know, being a Christian is fun. It's exciting. And if you don't have an exciting life as a Christian, then I would challenge you to reevaluate your walk with the Lord. Do I really have a strong walk with Him? Because if I don't, and I'm always down and I'm always bummed, it could mean because you have hardened your heart to that place where you can't receive from God. But guess what? 
Can God soften and break that stony heart? Yes. You bet. He can break it in a moment of time. He can break it in an instant by surrendering to Him, by giving all to Him, by allowing Him to break you and to come back in His presence and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've walked away. I'm sorry that I have not done what you wanted me to do. I'm sorry that I've been angry with you. God, forgive me, change me, help me, make me the person you want me to be. And God will do that very thing. And he'll fill your heart with such joy and such excitement for the life that you can have here, but not only here, but in eternity, that life that he has for us. God does laugh. However, this portion of scripture is not describing a scene where God is trying to be funny. It's more like what man is trying to do to God is funny. It's preposterous what man is trying to do. God sees these puny little people down on this puny little planet shaking their puny little fists at him and saying, come on, God, if you're real and if you're so powerful, then come out and fight, man. I'm ready for you. Isn't that really what they're saying? They're mocking God. They're saying all these things against him. And they're shaking their fists and they're getting angry. And that's what this is talking about. God's sitting in heaven and he's laughing. He's just going, oh, if you only knew. You know, he's just, it's preposterous that they, what they think they can do to God. Because they don't understand his power, his majesty, who he is. I guess the best illustration I can give you is to try to understand, is to put ourselves in that parent-child role. And you know what I'm talking about where a child comes up to you and they say something so utterly ridiculous and they stand on it and they just, you just don't know, I know better than you do. And you just look at them and you say, oh, you just don't understand. You know that what they're doing is so foolish and so silly, right? Anybody ever have that happen to them? This is the picture right here. This is what God is doing. This is the perfect example of what he's doing. These are his kids and he's going, oh, you just don't realize that what you're saying is so preposterous. And I want to help you. I want to change you. I want to change your mind. Just listen to me. But they don't. God laughs at the audacity that his creation has. But then in verse 5, God acts. He says, then he will speak to them in his wrath. Listen, just because God laughs doesn't mean that he is inactive in heaven. That he is not doing what must be done. First, we see that God shall speak to them. And to me, this is so awesome. We don't want to miss this because it shows us once again the total mercy and grace of of God. How? Because he speaks a word of warning to them before he acts. You've got to catch that. He speaks to them first. He gives them a word of warning. Everywhere we turn in Scripture, we always see a demonstration of God's mercy and grace as it pertains to judgment. He always gives opportunity, does he not? to repent, to change before the judgment comes. So how does this example in verse 5 make you guys feel about God's mercy and grace towards you and others in your life? How do you feel about this mercy and grace that he always gives it before judgment might come? Feels good. Hmm? Feels good. Grateful? What else? We have a chance. We have a chance. We know that it, we can change, right? We don't need to listen. We need to listen. Mm -hmm. And we what know else? that people we love get a chance to. There you go. People you love. There's people probably in your lives, right? That are family members who have walked away from the Lord or children who have turned their backs on God. Listen, 
This is telling you that God's going to speak to them first. You continue to pray for them. You speak to them too. You share your, you, you share and you, you know, be bold with them. But God's going to give them opportunity. Listen, why do you think we're still here? <laughs> why do you think we're still here and it's taking so long for the Lord to come? Because he doesn't want what? To lose he, one. he desires that none should perish, right? That all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But there will come a day when he says, it's now time. And he will come. And we believe that's around the corner because of the signs and the prophecies that have been fulfilled. And the world that we live in, it's all lining up. The stage is set, folks, for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we just have to understand that we must be urgent as we speak to our families, our friends, our children, our co-workers, our husbands, our wives. We have to let them know Jesus is coming. And we need to be ready. Because that's what's important. You know, if you live to be 100 years old, I don't care. Let's use a nice round number. How, I, mean, I always give this example, but how fast is that? Now I'm going to put some of you on the spot. Hard, how old are you? 71. How fast did it go? Uh, it's going pretty quick. Now. <laughs> going pretty quick. I won't pick on the women because you guys will you guys, you guys will shoot me. Larry, how old are you? Uh, how old am I? 68. How fast did it go? Yeah, real fast. Real fast. Luke. Or Luke. 36. And? It went quick, though, didn't it? Yeah, where did the time go? It's like I blinked my eye, and my daughter is 14 years old. She was just born yesterday. What happened? Okay, so if you live to be 100 years old in eternity, that's it. Remember the little sparrow? Example, little sparrow flies from... The Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean, takes a drop of water in his beak, flies back to the Atlantic Ocean, drops the water, flies all the way back to the, to the East Coast, takes another drop of water, flies all the way back to the West Coast, drops it. By the time that sparrow empties the entire Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, that's the first second of eternity. Eternity is a long time. Where do you want to spend it? I want to spend my eternity with Jesus Christ. If that means I'm going to suffer here on this earth a little bit as a Christian, so be it. I would rather suffer for a short time and live in glory for eternity. Well, I don't believe that. Well, there are children who believe in Santa Claus. Just because they believe in Santa Claus, does that make it real? No. So in the opposite, just because they don't believe it's true, does that change the truth? No. no. The truth is the truth. And it's written in the Word of God. And we know it's truth because the Bible is the only self-fulfilling prophetic book that has proven itself time and time and time and time again by the prophecies that are contained within it that it is accurate, that it is the inerrant Word of God. And we've got the book, and we know the beginning from the end. We know what's going to happen. And we just got to hang on. In verse 6, we come to a place where we see the end of the days spoken of, along with Jesus, our Lord and Messiah, being spoken of. In verse 6, we read, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So after all the kings of the earth and the rulers of the planet rebel against the Lord, it'll be one day, it'll all one day, I should say, culminate at the Battle of Armageddon. And it's at the end of this bloody battle that the Lord will establish his kingdom. He will reign on his holy hill in Jerusalem, which is known as Zion. Where will you be at that time? Anyone? Right next to him. Right next to him. Doing what? What will you be doing? Grazing. Grazing him. What else will you be doing? Ruling and reigning. Ruling and reigning. As what? Me. Hmm? What are your titles? Ruling and reigning is what? What are your titles? Saints. Saints. Judges. No. no. Priests. Yeah. Priests and what else? Priestess. Kings. Priestesses. There you go. <laughs> 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 Priestesses. 
<laughs> as kings and priests. That's your role. You'll be ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years during the millennial reign. And at the end of the millennial reign, for the ages to come, whatever that means, but that excites me. For the ages to come, it says we will be ruling and reigning with him. This is all because of what's happening here on that holy hill in Zion. At the end of that battle. Listen, we go from God not laughing and holding the naysayers in contempt to once again offering them his mercy and grace to ultimately inflicting his judgment on those who refuse to repent. Do we think that there will be any excuses at the judgment seat of God? No. No. Can you imagine being at the judgment seat of God and someone said, well, wait a minute. Hold on, God. Mm -mm. You know, that ain't going to happen. They will be at the judgment seat of God and they'll be on their face. They'll be flat on their face in shame as their life flashes before them for everyone to see. How would you like your dark little secrets in your mind? Your dark hidden things that each of us have that nobody knows about. How would you like them revealed for everyone to see? No, thank you. Guess what? They're buried as far as the east is from the west. Never to be recalled. Never to be looked upon. God forgave them. He buried them. And they are gone. When you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God looks upon you as righteous. Not because of you, but because of what Jesus did for you. And so he sees you as a perfect creature as the done deal. Well, we're not the done deal yet, but we will be in eternity because of how God looks upon us because of what His Son has done. There will be no excuses in heaven. David now declares the decree about what the <coughs> Lord has said to His anointed. So who again is the Lord and who is the anointed? God and Jesus, right? God and Jesus. All right, let's read verses 7 through 9. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So when we read this phrase, I will tell the decree of the Lord and what he said to me. Who is doing the speaking here? God. Hmm? Father, God the Father. Almost. Well, I could say, yeah, because they're one. But what person of the Trinity is doing the speaking here? Who's the anointed? Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, the anointed. He's the one who's speaking here. It's important for us to know and understand this as you read it. So the anointed himself, Jesus Christ, is speaking. And what he's declaring is the decree that God the Father spoke to him. The Father said to Jesus, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now, we'll talk about begotten and how it's misunderstood in just a second. But first, let's talk about the phrase, you are my son. Here Jesus simply states what God the Father spoke to him, identifying him as the Son of the Father and emphasizing his standing as the begotten of the Father. Again, we'll get to the begotten in just a second. Now let's read Hebrews verse 5 in chapter 1. And this will shed some light on this verse for us. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be in him a father and he shall be to me a son. So here the writer of Hebrews quotes what? Quotes Psalm 2, chapter 7, the one we're just in. And he quotes it as evidence of Jesus' deity and his superiority to all the angels. We also see a confirmation that Jesus is indeed the son of God. And if we keep reading past verse 5 in that 
a chapter in Hebrews, we'll also see the triune Godhead spoken of. But understanding the triune Godhead is really important for the Christian. In fact, I think it's so important that probably sometime in the near future, I probably do a, a little series on that about the triune Godhead to help all of us to get a really good grip of what that is. And it's not easy, but we can do the best we can to really get a, a good understanding. Because you don't want to just say, well, I believe it because my mother told me. I believe it because that's what my family believes. I believe it because my church believes it. I believe it because my pastor teaches it. No, you want to believe it because you understand it. And you know what it means and you see the evidence. And I think we'll do a series on that at some point. Would you guys like that? Yes. Okay, we'll do that in the near future. The beginning of verse 5 is a clear confirmation that Jesus is indeed the eternal Son of God. Now, Let's get to the statement, today I have begotten you, in verse 7. Very misunderstood. Does anyone have any idea? I'll just throw it out there. Anyone have any idea what this means, today I have begotten you? Today I have become your father. Today I have become your father. And what is today? What point in time is that? Anybody? When he was born. When hmm? he was born. No. When he accepted me. Hmm? Created. <laughs> Which one? Created. Give it, give it life. I mean, today I've begotten you means Jesus came into being. Right, he came into being, but wasn't he always into being? Yes. Okay, so. Not an earthly being. Not an earthly being, but what is it speaking of? The resurrection. The resurrection. Good. It's speaking of the resurrection. When the writer of Hebrews made reference to Psalm 2-7, it was not to the birth of Jesus Christ. In other words, every other portion of Scripture makes it very clear that Jesus is indeed the eternal, always was, always will be. So we know that Psalms 119, 164 states, as I always teach you what, the sum of thy word is truth. That you can't just take a verse here and a verse there and say, this is my doctrine, because it's out of context. You've got to take the sum of his word, the Bible in its entirety, and that's truth. And, that's, and, and the Bible, it all lines up, by the way. So you will get truth as you search the word of God on a topic. So where does the begotten factor in? Well, as we said, the resurrection, it was out of the tomb. In other words, he did die, did he not? The man, Jesus, died. And he was in the tomb. But did he stay dead? No. no. He was resurrected on the third day. And so Jesus was begotten. And that word begotten means to be brought out of. Okay? To be born. To be brought out of. And here he was born out of the grave by his resurrection. Mm -hmm. Jesus always was the eternal son of God. And God is the eternal father. And you cannot have an eternal father without an eternal son. So I can only imagine that when God said this to his son, it was a love letter. A confirmation of what Jesus did for humanity on Calvary's cross. That just shows to me the awesome relationship of God the Father with his son. Jesus holds the nation's as his inheritance. That's what Psalm 2 verse 8 goes on to say. I will make the nations your, inher your heritage. In other words, Jesus will rule over all nations and all judgment is given to him. We read this in John 5 22. It says there the father judges no one but has given what? Some judgment, a little bit of judgment. All judgment to the Son. Why do you think he did that? Because the Son is the one who came to this world, who became a man, who died, who lived among us, who understands us, who paid the price for us. And so God says, hey, you have the right to judge. In fact, the world was created by who? Through Jesus. All things were created by him and through him. 
That's why we need a study on the Trinity. Some of you are going, huh? Oh. <laughs> but we know that this is the truth of the triune Godhead. In verse 9, David says, You shall break them with the rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. What group of people is this referring to? Anybody? This is during the tribulation. So it's referring to those people that are alive at the second coming of Jesus, those who refuse to accept, uh, accept Jesus Christ, those who made it through, that are still there. God is going to be their judge. Why? Because their names were not found in the book of life. They rebelled against God. They never surrendered to Him. Along with all those at the great white throne judgment throughout all of history who never came to Christ, whose names were never in the book of life. We need to remember that Jesus came first as a lamb, but when he returns, how does he come? As a lion. And the last verses. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. He's just saying, listen, be careful, O rulers of the earth. You better listen. You better know that I know what you're doing, and you better turn. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. He's telling them what to do. And he's telling them that the, the thing that they must do to get out of this place of trying to plan and do wicked things against him. Then he says, kiss the son. And that's really a kiss of submission to the son and submitting to him as Lord and Savior. Kiss the son. It also shows the affection that God wants in a relationship to him. Kiss the son. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is just an ending in this psalm saying, give your life to Christ. Give your life to God. Forget the world. It's not going to last. It's not going to burn. And it's all not going to be here. Why waste your time with this place? Come to me. Let me change your life. Let me make you the person I want you to make may be you to be. Let me heal you of your pain and your anguish. Let me flood you with my love. That's what Jesus wants to do. Amen? Amen.